We're reading from the Gospel of John this morning, some verses that John Wesley often used in his preaching. It's part of a larger conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus. Nicodemus has asked about how can one be born again. We're going to begin reading in verse 5 where Jesus answers, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. All this month, as I've been telling you, we're going to be delving deeper into the thought and theology of John Wesley, founder of the Methodist movement. You may know that he was an Anglican priest or a priest in what we know as the Episcopalian Church. He was also a scholar and had a position at Oxford University in England. And even though those were both distinguished posts, neither of those is where he had his biggest impact. His biggest impact was when he was sensitive to the call of God in his life, which led him to begin to preach out of doors. Now, when he first heard of this idea, he thought it absurd. He said, what preacher in their right mind would leave the church and leave their pulpit to go outdoors and preach to the people that might be passing by? But he had a young friend, George Whitfield, who was 24 years old, about a decade younger than Wesley, that was already doing this and telling him, I, I tell you, there's a, a mission field here. There are people coming. Do not judge me till you come and see. Come and observe for yourself and decide if you think this is of God. You come and see what happens and see if you think people are responding to the gospel of Jesus Christ in the streets and in the fields when I preach. So finally, Wesley decided he would go see. He went down there, and he was stunned. The first day he was there, George Whitfield began to preach, and by the time he was finished, 30,000 people had gathered to listen. Wesley was stunned. I'm stunned even thinking about it today. Preaching and 30,000 gathered to listen to the gospel, it was a sight to behold. Wesley still struggled with this. We have an entry from his journal where he talks about his response and how he decided to begin to do this. He writes this, I could scarce reconcile myself at first to the strange way of preaching in the fields, having been all my life, and then he puts in parentheses, till very lately, so tenacious of every point relating to decency and order that I should have thought the saving of souls almost a sin if it had not been done in a church. At four in the afternoon, I submitted to be more vile, he says, and proclaimed in the highways the glad tidings of salvation, speaking from a little eminence in a ground adjoining to the city to about 3,000 people. Now, this was outside of London, near a town called Bristol, in an, almost like a suburb in a place called Kingswood, where there were many miners. It was a mining community, so these miners had not been going to the established churches, but they began to respond, and their families began to respond to the preaching that Whitfield and now Wesley were beginning to do. And Wesley records later that he began to think about how this could be proper. And he thought of Jesus. And he thought, where did he do most of his teaching and preaching? Think about it. Out of doors. And Wesley said, that confirmed it. If it could work for Jesus, maybe it could work for me. And so he says, I resolve to continue to proclaim the gospel out of doors. After he's been there for 30 days, he notes in his journal that some 47,500 people had gathered to listen to the gospel when he preached. It was a turning point in his ministry. 
It's so important that we understand what we mean when we talk about salvation and being born again. I talked about it last week, the importance of all this, that we are saved by grace and born again through faith. It's just as important today as it was 200 plus years ago when John Wesley was preaching that we understand what we mean and what we're saying and how God is calling us to respond. When Wesley begins to preach about this, he records his sermons. I want to read a portion of one to you. He starts like this. If any doctrines within the whole compass of Christianity may properly be termed fundamental, they are doubtless two, the doctrine of justification and that of the new birth. Then he says that justification is that great work which God does for us in forgiving our sins. He follows that by saying that the new birth, or being born again, is that great work which God does in us in renewing our fallen nature. Now, Wesley argues that we all need to be saved because we all have the experience of sin or separation from God. He says we are less than God wants us to be. We are less than God has created us to be and less than we could be. But he talks about that in our free will and our humanity that we often choose our will as opposed to God's will. We often begin to go away from God, sometimes even knowingly, but sometimes not. But we find ourselves trusting our own choices without referring or reference to God or asking God for direction. And the separation or sin causes a spiritual death. He begins to talk about Adam and that story of Adam we find in Genesis where God had given Adam instructions to do certain things and Adam decided, no, I think I'll try some other things. And Wesley said, at that point, Adam dies, not a natural death, but a spiritual death. And then Wesley writes, accordingly, in that day, Adam did die. He died to God the most dreadful of all deaths, he lost the life of God. He was separated from God, in union with whom his spiritual life consisted. So he had lost both the knowledge and the love of God, without which the image of God could not subsist. So to be born again, as we understand it as Methodist, is to have a spiritual rebirth. To be born again is to experience a vital connection or reconnection with God. Wesley asks, so who, who is born again? His answer is those who have faith. And for Wesley, like most theologians, the idea of faith is trust in God. That we can trust this God. This is how Wesley describes it. The true living Christian faith, which whoever has is born of God, is not only an assent, an act of understanding, but a disposition which God has wrought in his or her heart. A sure trust and confidence in God. That through the merits of Christ, their sins are forgiven and they are now reconciled to the favor of God. This idea of trusting God, trusting that God loves us and is working for our good is so important for us to understand. This discussion that we've read from John today is all about that. Nicodemus has come at night. He is a leader of the Jewish people, but he's heard Jesus speak. He wants to talk more with him about what he's saying. And Jesus tells him, it's all right that you're doing all this, but you have to be born again or born from above. And Nicodemus says, how can that be so? That's where we picked it up in verse 5 where Jesus answers, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. I received an email not long ago from a fellow wanting to talk about this idea of being born again. 
He had been going to a place that was telling him he had to exhibit some special gifts, probably speaking in tongues, although he didn't say. He said, what do Methodists think it means to be born again? How would I know? And I said, well, primarily it's about experiencing the love of God and being filled with the love of God. And that's exactly what John Wesley wanted us to know, that this spiritual rebirth is being filled with the love of God. Wesley talks about, he asked the question, how does this happen? He uses the analogy of human birth. He says, just as a baby is forming in the womb, even though it may have ears, it doesn't really hear. It has eyes, but doesn't really see the light of the world. The baby's senses are muted in a sense while in the womb, and it changes when it's born, and it has a whole different way of life. And the eyes and the ears began to experience the world in a dramatically different way. Wesley says spiritual rebirth is the same thing. That until we have this vital connection with God, our spiritual sensibilities are muted, if you will. That we don't sense God's leading very well. We may not even be looking for God's leading. We don't have the ears to hear or the eyes of faith to see what God is doing in our life and how we might follow that most faithfully. But he writes about once that happens, once we recognize the love of God is offered to us without price, everything changes. He writes this, but as soon as a person is born of God, there is a total change in all these particulars. The eyes of his understanding are enlightened. He who of old commanded light to shine out of darkness shines on his heart, and he sees the light of knowledge of the glory of God, his glorious love and the face of Jesus Christ, his ears being opened. He is now capable of hearing the inward voice of God saying, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. This is the meaning of what God speaks to his heart, although perhaps not in these very words. Wesley goes on to say, you can tell it's happening because you see the fruit of it in a person's life. He takes the list of the fruits of the Spirit at one point that Paul talks about in Scripture and says, you're going to have more love, more joy, more peace, maybe more patience, maybe more kindness and gentleness, that you're going to be experiencing these things in, in greater amounts in your life as you recognize God is loving you and you begin to intentionally respond to that, you'll see these fruits of the Spirit, these fruits of a life with God filling you up, changing your life. He says it's not too much to say for some people that they were like dead humans before they became alive Christians. That it really can be a great change in a person's life to begin to experience all of this. He shares an illustration of this out of his own life. He talks about a time when he was traveling from place to place to preach, and he came into this one town and needed a shave. He found the barber shop and went in and had the shave and had a discussion with the barber about why he was there and where he was headed. He was just going down the road a little bit further to a church where he was going to preach. The fellow said, I was interested but Wesley left, I thought about it some more, and then I decided I would follow him. So without John Wesley knowing, the barber followed him. He said, but when I got to the church, I didn't feel like I could go in because I was one of the eminent drunkards in the whole town. And so the fellow said, I stayed outside, but I listened by the window, and as I did, God struck me to the heart. And I earnestly prayed for power against drinking. And God gave me more than I asked for. Not only a power not to drink, but he took away the very desire to drink. The man said it was wonderful for a few days. But then it began to get worse. It began to get harder. He wanted to drink again. He thought for sure, I'm going to drink again and I'm going to go to hell unless God himself appear. And he said, you know what? I felt the very presence of God that when I prayed, God was there for me. And I experienced the power to overcome 
that urge and a sweet peace filled my soul. And I feel like God ever since then has been filling me with this great love. And he said, but I just wasn't sure that I had enough faith or this really was going to hold. So I haven't told anyone about this. But yesterday was my 12-month anniversary. And so I feel sure God has given me this faith and has filled me with this love. And it will change my life forever. That's it, isn't it? It's a change of life. It's a change of heart. It's a work that God does in us. Sometimes quickly, sometimes over 12 months or maybe over 12 years. Jesus says it's like the wind blowing. It's always a bit of a mystery where it comes from and where it's going. But you can be sure that the Spirit is at work just as you can be sure the wind is going to blow. It shows up in our lives as a deep love of God and issues forth as a love of neighbor. It changes our desires. Often it changes our directions. It gives us the power to overcome sin. It moves us from loving things just for ourselves or just love of the world, as Wesley talks about it, and issues in a love of God and a love of others that we begin to want to serve others and to share our resources with others. And he says where maybe before there would have been anger, there's a sense of gentleness and peace. Where there might have been selfishness, there is a sense of generosity. Wesley preached over and over again. You can see the change in people's lives once they have recognized this grace of God being poured out upon them and accepted it. You can begin to see the change in the way that they live. Wesley describes in one of his sermons this way. It is so to love God who has thus loved you as you never did love any creature. So that you are constrained to love all men and women as yourselves. With a love not only ever burning in our hearts, but flaming out in all your actions and conversations. And making your whole life one labor of love. One continued obedience to these commands. Be ye merciful as God is merciful. Be holy for I the Lord your God am holy. Be thee therefore perfect in your loving even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Does your life look like that? Have you experienced this great outpouring of love? Wesley wants to talk about that over and over again. He so desires for people to have that experience and see it issue in practical ways in their lives where God's love is filling them and growing them and changing them. That's why he can conclude, like I shared with you at the end of the sermon last week, that even though we may not think alike, we can love alike. Because it's all about this great love of God that we have received. We've done nothing to earn it or merit it, yet God has offered it to us anyway. So we can disagree with each other, but it's still important that we love each other. He has another quote that I've put at the end of your outline. It is the glory of the people called Methodists that they can condemn none for their opinions or modes of worship, they think and let think and insist upon nothing but faith working by love. That's the keystone of Wesley's preaching. This idea that we are saved by grace or God's outpouring of love. And that once we've received it, it changes our lives forever. Oh, he saw people be more zealous and less, and he talks about how that can happen, how we can be on fire for a while and still drift away. He says not all sin is obliterated. It's still contending with God's love and direction. The world still surrounds us and offers us different options, but we need to attend to this very love of God. And as we do so, we'll experience the abundant life that Christ has promised us. 
Jesus is trying to help Nicodemus grasp this idea that he can be born again and not only live by the rules of religion, but have the very life of God or the very love of God within him. At one point, Wesley says it's like spiritual respiration that we are breathing into God and God's grace is being poured into us as we inhale and then we exhale praise or prayer or service and then we breathe in again and receive more of God's love and grace and he says as we do that we grow and mature into the full stature of Christ that the closer we get to God the more we experience this closeness with God the more God can shape us ever more into the image of Christ and we'll experience all the blessing God has to offer us and that God intends for us. If that sounds good to you, if that resonates with you, you might just be a United Methodist. Amen, and thanks be to God.